coming in. And we will call the first case of the day, which is U.S. v. Luis Gonzalez, 21-403-97. Somewhere I have a sheet with your names, but I'm not seeing it. So you can introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm happy to help you out there, Judge Higginson. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Judge Higginson, and may it please the court, Evan Howes on behalf of Virgilio Luna Gonzalez. Your Honors, um, we're here to talk today about, mostly about one of my favorite subjects, which is statutory interpretation. Um, specifically, the question here is about what it takes to satisfy the specific definition the firearm guideline provides for the term semi-automatic rifle capable of accepting a large capacity magazine, which of course was the crux of the base offense level enhancement applied in this case. Now, the, as usual, the interpretive inquiry should end in exactly the same place where it begins with the text. The, um, the relevant definition here create, specifically creates a functional condition and it ties that functional condition to a temporal condition. So what that means is that a qualifying semi-automatic firearm is one that has the present ability to fire many rounds without reloading. And the reason it has that ability is because a high capacity magazine is either attached to the firearm or in close proximity to the firearm at the time of the offense, which is to say at the time. Now, that the I'm just gonna zero in a little bit. It doesn't, isn't, but you wouldn't agree that close proximity alone counts because then it would apply. It's the compatibility issue that's is the thrust on that element? Or are you acknowledging if it's in the same box, then that that's good enough? No, we are not acknowledging okay. that if the 30 round magazine that was found with the rifle that was at issue. So put aside operability for now for me, but just go on the compatibility. The adverse order that you're appealing from is what? The adverse and, order. And what's the standard of review for? The standard uh, of review is clear error as to the failure of proof. Oh, okay. Right or or as to whether or not the government's evidence um, was sufficiently reliable to for the district judge to find beyond a preponderance of the evidence that this magazine was compatible with this firearm. And, so, and I'm just going to be provocative, so disagree if I have any wrong assumption. But it was a remote hearing, and those were complicated um, sentencing hearing. But do you agree that at least at the end of the hearing, the district court does appear to make a finding that it was compatible? And, so keep in mind all these propositions, and that paragraph 12 of the PSR appears to be the probation making a finding of compatibility. I, I do not, I do agree that the district judge ultimately found that there was compatibility here. We're not, we're not suggesting that Judge Alvarez made an error of law by failing no, to require. No, so that's a clearly erroneous fact finding. Is that your position? On compatibility, of yeah. course, operability. I know, I'm just asking about compatibility. Yes, on compatibility, we're talking about a finding was made, and we think that that finding was wrong because the quantum of proof on this record did not sufficiently prove okay. that what that's what was I necessary. thought the argument would have to be. There is a finding of it. Now, here's the tricky area, and both both parties, I think, cited the law. The government's citing Betacourt. You're responding in your reply brief with Zuniga. We are in the situation, I think, where there is a PSR fact finding, paragraph 12. And does that shift it to your client to rebut it? No. Or is that an, the government, okay, no. We, we, we contend no, Judge Higginson. Yeah. The reason is if you read, you obviously have read paragraph 12. The, the probation officer does not assert any fact that is actually relevant outside of proximity. So it would have to be. Well, based on a review of the investigative material and an independent investigation, it's determined that Luna possessed two firearms, one of which was a semi-automatic and capable. So it, it seems to be a conclusory assertion that we've done our independent investigation and we found it's compatible. Yes or no? I, I, I don't think that that's enough, Judge Higgins, okay. to just simply assert. That would be like saying, uh, that would be like saying, asserting that this burglary offense involved violence, right? Because now burglary doesn't qualify under 4B1.2 unless it involved violence. To just simply say that is not to say the reason it involved violence is because somebody hit another person. When they say it, it then shifts you to object, and you did. Then we get to the hearing, and you would think the government would have to prove it up. Am I correct in the hearing? The government did ask Agent Estrada 
but then somehow the thing the the, the, the sentencing hearing was muted he never answered no no no, no. so no. what happened was the the government called agent Estrada but the government did not first agent Estrada did have trouble so at first when I was reading the transcript too I thought oh my there was you know nobody ever ended up testifying but he, agent Estrada his screen did eventually come on so he did testify the district court did a direct examination and he was not asked a single question about compatibility you're pretty sure of that? I thought he was asked sure about it, but then everyone starts saying, oh, he's still muted. No, 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 no. Oh, we okay. we a, a, move three or four pages beyond that in the transcript. I've got it with me if, if okay. you need me to get it on rebuttal. But they specifically have a colloquy. The district judge asked four or five targeted questions, but they're all targeted so operability. They just, they just forgot to ask and close the loop. Final question, because I tend to dominate, but the final question then is, you, you in your principal brief, your reply brief, you say vacate, remand for resentencing. Does that mean, and maybe the government agrees, that someone's just going to ask Estrada that question now at resentencing? No, be, and, and the problem, Judge Higginson, is that that's a fact that was totally readily available to be proved if it, if it was there to be proven at the hearing. And so there, the government wasn't denied the chance to, to prove that fact. Now, maybe if Agent Estrada had- When you say vacate, remand for resentencing, are you actually suggesting that we, our decree to language, say something less? vacate remand with instructions to subtract the offense level? Is that what you're really asking? No, 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 no. of course not, Judge Higginson. So it, it is a fundamental um, proposition that when a case goes back, the government or the defendant doesn't get a second bite at the apple to prove facts. Say that the fundamental proposition is we have really wrestled with that. Well, chemical and metal industries is a case that talks about it. You yourself authored an opinion that I was was involved in. Okay, um, give me sites for those because I do think it's an issue that's bedeviling our court. But right. what's United. chemical engineering? That's a criminal case. Um, yes, okay. it was a, a case against the company. There's also a case called United States versus Via Lobos. I believe it was 2017 or 2018. When you get back up, can you give the sites? I'm not disagreeing with you. I just think it's a troubled area of our law. I do not have the reporter oh, sites. I'm, that's all right. I'm happy to file. No, the government may agree with you. Citations okay. No argument. All right. Um, but I understand the argument, and and I think you're right. But I'm just right. Well, because is your point that the issue is now defaulted as to the government? I, my point is that the government would have to rely on whatever proof is already in the record. It had its. It's, it's like a. It, can't reopen the record. Right. It's it's like a trial. They, you know you don't you don't get a chance to go back and put in new evidence. You have the hearing. Sentencing is the same way. What if the transcript does say he's asked the question, but it then says it's clear, technological error muted. Would we would would that give them a second bite? Maybe if that was the end of the, the testimony, but of course he did get to testify. Later the government had every opportunity Come to back. ask that question, it never did. And okay. so the, the, we, don't, we think that there isn't sufficient proof of compatibility here. We don't know what this magazine looks like. We don't know if it was a Diamondback magazine. We don't know if it was similar to the type of magazines that fit in a Diamondback 15 rifle. We don't even know um, we, we literally don't know anything about it. And so that's, that's the problem. The other problem, the error of law, outside of that error of fact that we think here um, today that I wanted to get to is that this rifle did not have the present ability to fire any rounds at the time that Mr. Luna Gonzalez possessed it. And so we think that that means that even apart from the compatibility of the rifle, the court should vacate and remand. And this is a simple, question of statutory interpretation. We have a What do you make of the fact that, well, actually, let me step back and ask this. Uh, what is your best basis for the theory that compatibility is part of capability? So our best basis, Judge Ho, is that it's not about compatibility. That's the term that's being defined. Semi-automatic firearm capable of accepting a large capacity magazine is a term of art as it's defined here. The definition is what matters, the plain, ordinary meaning of the words of the definition. That's the interpretation. You say definition, you're, you're talking about the commentaries? You're yes. Talking about, okay. We're talking about because it's, it's capable of. Is that where? No, no. Well, what it is, is it? Has the ability to fire many rounds without reload. Oh, this is on operability. I'm sorry. Right. And so, the, and to, to answer your question. Are we talking about operability or? Right now, we've gone, we've moved over to operability. If you, if you're asking me whether or not the, let's, there, let's say, I apologize because I know your time's running, but I want to stick, stick with the compatibility issue because of this remand, you know, reopening the evidence issue. Is compatibility in our case law, or is this something that we're talking about? I hesitate to say adding to our case law, but would this be breaking new ground, perhaps correctly or incorrectly? 
to the extent that the court has never said the interpretation of the words in this definition require a showing of compatibility yes because you know here's where i'm going is given that it's theoretically a new standard perhaps a textually based one but a standard that's not in our case law why wouldn't the government get a second chance well because the government using a new theory i think i don't think it is a new theory because i think everyone operated under the assumption here that compatibility was required the government was well we made the objection we said that there's no evidence this specific magazine can fit this rifle the government came back in its um written objection and said no we think we can show that we'll have the agent testify and then we had a hearing and they didn't ask any questions about compatibility and so i mean we should assume that the government felt that what was in the psr was sufficient and we say that it wasn't um and i mean uh, of course i think that's the that's the point but let, let's put it this way judge ho if even if you think that they can reopen on compatibility, there's a serious issue here that that, that wouldn't matter because the firearm was inoperable at the time of the offense. And so I would, if I could, with the time remaining, like to, to switch to that issue because it's an important one. Like I said, it's one of statutory interpretation. We're talking about plain, ordinary meaning right here. The, the words of that definition require a firearm to have the, have the ability to fire many rounds without reloading because at the time of the offense a, f a magazine or similar device that could accept 30 or more rounds was either attached to the firearm or was in close proximity to the firearm right and so if you look at what look at the important terms there has the ability and to fire those are in the present tense Tense, of course, is an indicator of meaning. We've held that in many cases. The Supreme Court's talked about it, specifically in Nichols versus United States, Carr versus United States. It matters that these are defined in the present tense. For one, it excludes past tense. We cannot be talking about a firearm that had the ability to fire many rounds in the past. We have to be talking about one that has the present ability to fire many rounds. And so if you move on beyond that, the rest of the definition itself reinforces the point that what we're talking about here is firearms that are kept in close proximity to magazines that would allow them to bring the destructive capability of these firearms to bear in short order, right? So we have be the because clause, because at the time of the offense is creating a specific link between that functional component and the temporal component. The reason the firearm has the ability to fire is because it is, it's got a magazine either literally on it or readily accessible and nearby. And so that is a further indicator that what we're talking about is magazines that are close or on the thing. And so what the Sentencing Commission is, atta is attaching greater culpability to people who keep otherwise legal firearms. These firearms could be possessed lawfully if you're not a prohibited person in a state where they could be used to bring that, the, the relevant problem to bear. What is, your, what is your client's um, projected release date? Judge Willett, I'm glad you asked about that. I would have been remiss not to say his projected release date is November 24 of this year. And right. so even if you were to rule in his favor, even if he got a sentence at the high end of the appropriate guideline range, he would be due out right now um, right. immediately. And so, um, so absent the erroneous, as you see it, the erroneous elevated base offense level, would he be out today? Yes, he would have been out on November 24 of 21 if Judge Alvarez sentences to 18 months, right? So Judge Alvarez could, of course, decide she wanted to bury up a little bit above it, somewhere between the 30-month sentence he got and the 18-month range. So it's not exactly clear. We don't think she would, and of course, she would have to explain that with uh, under 3553C with sufficient reasons. But at the very least, we think it's likely he would get, at, at most, a top of the guidelines range sentence. And so if if the sentence is to, if the ruling is to be in our favor, we would obviously appreciate it to, to come as, as quickly as possible. But that, you know, is entirely up to the court. We're we're here to explain why this firearm was not qualifying because of the inoperability and because the government didn't prove compatibility. And with the brief time I have remaining, and I guess we'll have to get to it more on rebuttal, there is that Eighth Circuit opinion in United States versus Davis out there. There's three huge flaws with that opinion. And the first one that I'll, that I'll bring up now in the short time that I have is that that opinion started its analysis with legislative and amendment history and used the legislative and amendment history to 
override the plain meaning of the definition here now that is the exact opposite of the interpretive analysis that this court and all courts apply its textualism at that is nails on chalkboard to textualism to start there and so the the problem is that the the Eighth Circuit used the history to to contort the meaning or not to contort but to overlook the actual plain meaning of these words and if you look at that plain meaning it requires a firearm that has the present ability to fire during your rebuttal time I may ask you about our courts Polk decision did you yes. talk about the Eighth Circuit Thank you, Ms. Akins. <clears throat> May it please the court. Good morning, Jessica Akins for the United States. Um, it's lovely to be back in person. Nice to see you all. Uh, we're here today to discuss this um, troubling issue we have about what kind of evidence is required to show the semi-automatic firearm is capable of accepting a large capacity magazine. And I'd like to start quickly just that we know from our opinions here in the Fifth Circuit in Longoria and Rosa that the commentary is authoritative under 2K2.1. And we also know from Abrego recently last year that the commentary is admittedly ambiguous. So we do have our work cut out for us. Um, with that said, I thought I might just start real quickly um, with the chronology of these objections on the two issues um, in case you have questions about the government's burden, which you addressed um, just recently, Judge Higginson. Um, I heard the um, discussion about the PSR and whether that statement is sufficient. Um, I'd like to also point out after the PSR, two weeks after the PSR is issued, the defendant um, submits his written objections, several objections, there's probably five or six in there. The one with regard to the 2K2.2 is twofold, and it has to do with the um, missing bolt carrier group and that we had no evidence that the magazine fit the gun. One simple statement. However, what I didn't hear discussed was two weeks after that, the um, probation officer filed an addendum. An addendum is treated as part of the PSR, and the addendum is actually the first time you see an addressment of the commentary, which I think is important, as we know from Abrego. The commentary is important, it should be looked at by all parties. So in the addendum, the probation officer goes through the legal definition, which we all have been discussing, um, what does capable of accepting a large capacity magazine mean? And it goes through the two definitions that we all are familiar with, attached to or in close proximity to. And then after that legal definition, the probation officer then goes through the facts again where this diamondback was found, this information was taken from the ATF agents, and how they, they found the weapon, the weapon, the magazine, together in the big black box, in a rifle box, that was put together by the defendant. We don't have to ignore the defendant's actions. We can make a rational inference. The defendant presented that box, that gun, and that magazine for customization together. And so the sentencing is two weeks later, and of course, this, this issue isn't mentioned again. But the more I've looked at it, I think there's a rational interpretation to be made that, yes, the government had the burden, and we put forth the evidence, the defendant properly objected, then the probation put forth more facts to substantiate it. It's highly possible that the issue was taken care of and put to bed because not one party mentions it again at sentencing. They all parlay into the other issue, which is more unique, the bolt carrier group, and that is the focus of the sentencing judge. When the sentencing, sentencing judge asks the defense, what would you like to say on the record? What's your objection? That is the only thing he mentions, and they are all laser focused on that issue. And they flesh it out. This is all taken care of at ROA 113? I think it's a rational interpretation of the evidence. Did you argue waiver to us? on this issue? I did not. And I don't think I know off the top of my head. I agree to you, focus on the addendum, but I guess I'm asking you a legal and a factual question. Factually, because I don't have a first-hand memory of the addendum, does the probation officer say, good point, here's the new evidence? It's more of an expansion of the evidence. Expansion of In the terms evidence. of where we got the evidence. You know how you had talked about how the PSR, we have general statements in PSR. No, I know, I know how PSRs work. So, and I don't remember this in the government's brief, that you are now saying the addendum response 
created a waiver situation? Not necessarily a waiver. So, so, okay, if it's not a waiver, they preserved an objection, which does mean it's got to be resolved because it's going to have a consequence. And then you're, are you agreeing it was not resolved at, this, at the train? No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm arguing that after they properly put forth that objection, I think they were saying there's not enough here. Right. I think that we expanded in the addendum to say, here's some more information. Here's specifically why we're relying on it. Is that the it. government's position in the brief, that the addendum resolves this, there was nothing to be resolved? I believe in the brief, Your Honor, I, I summarized all the facts and I put a citation to both. So I, maybe I didn't delineate that. I, I'm not aware of case law that says if you object, then you've got to re-object if probation does what it usually does, issue an addendum and say, no, we stick by what we said. I, I think overwhelmingly the case law says that's going to be a disputed issue and it's got to be resolved. So if I'm right on that, and maybe you know law that says I'm wrong, Am I correct that at the hearing, in fact, the question was asked to Estrada? He was asked, is it compatible or is it capable of? But then, you, do you have a memory of that or am I just inventing? I don't see it in there. Okay. I think there's a discussion about what my recollection, and I just pulled it out. I think the recollection is that the, that the sentencing judge is taking care of all the questioning. So that part's a little bit different than most cases. And so what the pro prosecutor says to the judge is, Your Honor, we're going to bring Agent Estrada. He's here to answer all these questions yep. about this issue, this issue, this issue. That is said. And then, of course, once he gets on, we have the issues. The first question she starts asking him is, please tell us what a bulk carrier group, what's the function? And then they really just laser focus on that. And they just never circle back to that question. Okay. I want to go back to the addendum because I'm not sure. sure why you think this helps you. All I see is a statement that at the time the firearm was seized, quote, it was accompanied by a 30 round capacity magazine in a black rifle box. Mm -hmm. How does that help on compatibility? I think it helps in the way that they're asking, well, first of all, I, you know, as this will be the big question today is, does the Fifth Circuit require that? Does it require compatibility of it being fit? I think um, it's more of an expansion of why we think this is appropriate. And it also goes back to what Longoria says in terms of a statement, a PSR and or addendum can suffice this kind of evidence without more objection. So is your position, is the government's position then that A, compatibility is not required, and B, if it is to be required as of this case, you should at least get the chance to prove it up. Yes. Yes, Your Honor. I've heard our opposing counsel sort of suggest that even if we don't have case law on compatibility, it's just part of a custom and practice. Everybody understands it. We just haven't said it yet. Do you, you disagree with that description? Well, that's very complicated. Um, as of right now, there is no law in the Fifth Circuit that there is compatibility. That's correct under ROHA. Um, I think when you, a lot what of the other circuits, if you know. Uh, this is what's interesting. I don't think that those cases that are cited stand for the proposition that it has to be compatible. If you look at the, um, I wrote down the three cases they cited, Ochoa, Pete, and Torres, they're good cases. And I think what you see in that case is the government went above and beyond. The agent said, oh, let me show you. I'm going to connect this and fire it so you can see it's compatible. I have no problem with that, but I think that is really more of a beyond a reason about standard. We're at preponderance here on sentencing. I'm sorry, what, why do you think it's tied up to the standard review? Or the, 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 because you know, this... I mean, it, it, in other words, it's an element or it's not. The compatibility? Right. Yeah, I don't believe it's an element at this point. It is not in the text of the commentary. No, I understand that, but you're saying these other cases that say it's an element or suggest it's an element, it was all wrapped up in the burden of proof. Tell me how that works. Um, to me, it's, it's either a thing or it's not a thing. I agree. I, maybe I misspoke there. I apologize. I didn't mean to imply it was an element. What I meant to say was that they found that the uh, elevated base offense level was met because they had such an abundance of evidence. It was a litigation strategy. Yes. To so in my mind, why, why is it not a requirement, though? Why isn't it not obvious from uh, the whole concept of capability? As I think we all understood, capability is not a hypothetical, theoretical future reality. It's you can actually use it either right this second or very quickly because it's in such close proximity. Doesn't that all well, strongly imply, if not explicitly require, that it actually works? I think that's where we're the capability and could be. I think that's what the Davis and Evans cases are talking about. It, 
this is a more of a policy and how these weapons are designed has to go into the language it doesn't mean nothing has said that that gun has to be operable in ten seconds that is nowhere in the commentary and that isn't the purpose of the law if you look back at davis and evan well, just if you have a weapon that is in theory could be modified with a lot of effort over a period of months would that satisfy the enhancement it could be modified over several months with different parts probably yes that would satisfy it well think i guess i can't say specifically on what is the point of close proximity then close proximity i, I, I heard you accept the, the guidelines yes. you're not contesting the guidelines don't i'm sorry the commentary to the guidelines you're not contesting at least today that the commentary is essentially part of the text i think so, that the background that um, defense counsel alluded to has a lot to do with this that when the um the assault rifle cases when that statute uh went away, I guess, in 2004. These, this commentary was written in 2006. So I think there was a concerted effort to keep not just guns that can be fired, but guns that may be used in the future. Okay, just a simple question. Something can be in the, the, the extra magazine, the, the 30 mm -hmm. round magazine, can be in close proximity, but it doesn't have to work. Correct. Doesn't have to be loaded. Nothing says any of these guns have to be loaded and ready to go ready to fire, that's not, that's not an element of the commentary. So as long as it's physically nearby, but it's completely incompatible, doesn't work at all, that would satisfy the enhancement. Textually, Your Honor, right now, that's oh, where it, we are. It's a, it's a literalist argument, whether yeah. it's textually reasonable, I think, is the debate. And you said it was ambiguous and abrego, and I agree, it is. Um, I guess we just have to go back and see what kind of proof is necessary, and I guess that's why I brought up the preponderance of an evidence. The, the government's theory, essentially, is it may be absurd, but it's the text. Do I have to say that out loud? Yes. Well, do, do, but do you acknowledge it sort of makes, I mean, yeah. what, what drafter, I'm not, I'm not saying this is therefore right or wrong, but like, it's a weird drafter to say, you know what, it's really important to me that it be really, really close. If it ever works or not, I could care less. It could be a toy uh, large magazine. It's really it doesn't big. matter. I just want it to be really close. That's what bothers me. That's what requires the enhancement. I agree. And I think that's the policy argument of being having these laws for violent crimes that we don't want these pieces all together with felons or people who are illegal aliens you're not supposed to possess any part of a weapon that they can put together but standing there today can the government point to a single case holding that proximity alone proximity alone is sufficient proof of compatibility uh no I think that the cases that we have that looked at the PSR statement being um, sufficient don't necessarily turn on that word, but that they find close proximity without evidence of it fitting have been sufficient. Well, does, and that's does our POC decision help you? I guess. I'm sorry? I think it's, I don't know, P A U L K. I think I'm unfamiliar with that one at this moment. As I understand it, I, I certainly need to read it more carefully as well, is there's this notion that just even the appearance of being uh, uh, capable of firing more than 30 rounds, that's dangerous. It heightens the intensity of the crime scene. I think that's Appearance, obviously, is very different from compatibility. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if the government might not want to take advantage of it. Um, and I can definitely follow up with you on that specific case, but it does sort of remind me of the language that's in Evans about capability and does that have to be a certainty? You know, like you said, this is a policy about people that are having weapons and parts of weapons that can be adapted. And I think what's interesting about Evans is they do talk about, you know, we're having this statutory construction conversation. The order of language matters. And when you look back, and let me pull it just so I'm saying it Before correctly. you do, if you were writing our opinion, the court affirms the enhanced sentence because what? Procedural bar? Standard review? What's the government's request here? It's the text, it's not. No, not the text. Uh, to, we affirm because we don't see there's clear error in applying the enhancement or something else. What's, what is the way you would write the decision? I think that the, the most compelling thing is that compatibility is not required. You're pushing, you're placing us to a higher burden at this point in time. So you're saying legally, the enhancement does not require compatibility, it requires what? Close proximity. Well, Five, okay, but I thought you just plus. answered Judge Willett. You don't know of a case that allows proximity alone. Well, that'll get me to this, what I was just about to say about the, the order of the language is what matters. So capability is before the subparts. And so what Evan says is the capability, accepting a large magazine, means you can fire many rounds quickly 
at the at one time right so it because at the time it has to have these two things those two things which is being attached or the close proximity they're modified by that statement of but not at capability at the time so at the time only requires the close proximity or the attachment it doesn't require that you be able to fire the fifteen the way the words are modified it's very so even if it could never attach as long as it's near it it counts that's uncomfortable but i feel like that's the way it reads unless this court wants to find otherwise okay again did you argue that to the district court and is that even in your this issue was not argued at sentencing the uh the bulk carrier group was argued you heard me with opposing counsel i thought this was just a clear error review of a fact finding made by the district court mm -hmm. but now you're saying the enhancement applies any time it's near it even if it would never attach and the agent admits it's What's the government's argument, well, the legal cases, or factual? Well, I think it's both. It's factual on the PSR. I think we've presented evidence that shows other cases like Longori. If you have information in the PSR and the, the addendum. All the PSR says is proximity. The addendum has the commentary language, which is why I added that. No, I'm looking at the addendum. It says, all, I, tell me, that's why I want to make sure I understand this. Okay. This, this, the addendom argument. All I see is it's accompanied by a 30-round magazine. Is that, is that the language I'm supposed to look at, or do you have some? So I'm looking at page 113 right, of the addendum, too. where it says response, and it says commentary application note. So it goes through the definition, and then says, in this case, the diamond DV-15 possessed by the defendant constitutes a firearm capable. At the time of the said firearm that's seized by the ATF agents, it was accompanied by a 30-round magazine and a black rifle box. That's Longoria, though. So that's all you've got is proximity. Mm -hmm. So this is reaffirming, this is really just your same argument is proximity is all that matters. I don't care about compatibility. I don't care about sure. operability. In, it's just nearby. Without the argument of compatibility, that's the prior law on this circuit from Longoria is that that statement would be sufficient. Sorry to interrupt. But no, no, no. On the helpful. factual. So expanding it to the compatibility, which hasn't been um, addressed by this court, we only have these out of circuit courts. Um, and they are putting on lots of evidence to show it. But I guess, too, you have to wonder. Why is it at or? Why is it attached or close, or close proximity? If, if, the, if it was meant to be close proximity that attached or was compatible, that language would be in there. And it's visibly not. It's either attached, which the attached obviously shows compatibility, right? We can all agree if you can attach it, it's compatible. They left this language in there in 2006 for a reason. Not necessarily could be attached but not work. That's true. Presumption. Presumption that if you can attach it, it's probably If you're it. not persuasive, do you agree that, that you don't get a second bite? We can't go back and unmute well, the agent? On the law of the case, from what I've read, it depends on the, the specific remand language from this court. Um, in terms of if you believe, if that is the law now, we did not know that before, we should be able to present evidence, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. Um, I'm presenting the, the best record that we can. It wasn't all done great. I think we can all agree there could have been a lot more What's done. What's the government's recommendation if you don't prevail? If I don't prevail, I would love a really good opinion that's clear and that's concise. And no, that, I mean as to this case, the remand, at the resentencing. Uh, well, at the resentencing, with regard to the remand, um, I think it needs to be specific in terms of is this uh, issue able to be relitigated, which we believe it should be, be, because we weren't, there was nothing from the Fifth Circuit telling us that that had to be met, that we had to show it fit at this point in time. Could we have done it? Of course. Of course we could have done that, but we did not. Um, if not, if we don't have the you chance. believe it was compatible and operable. Yes, if that's going to be the law. If that's the law. Great, let us know the law, and I tell you what, our people would be great to know the law, Violent crime is an issue. It is a it is a big deal, obviously, and it's it's a priority of the Department of Justice. We're going to continue to file these cases. We want them to be right. We want the facts to fit the commentary and the guidelines and the law from this circuit. Just quick question: So the United States has now, uh, to its credit, but maybe rather belatedly, conceded that the serial number belongs yeah. to the firearm and not to the magazine. And I'm just curious, what prompted that epiphany? Uh, more review. More review of the case when it was getting set. Um, and I apologize profusely. I've also let my boss know that I will be taking more weapon CLE, so hopefully I won't make a mistake like that in the future. This argument that proximity is 
literally just proximity. It's not compatibility, not interoperability, uh, not operability. Uh, has that been the, pardon my ignorance, has that been the government's consistent position in the various circuits, or is that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? If is this the government's position in other cases that under this sentencing guideline 2K2.1, uh, that proximity is all that matters literally? Compatibility not required, operability not required. Uh, are you just saying that today, or has the government been saying this in other no, cases? It, to my knowledge, and I can uh, only speak for the Southern District at this point, that is our position as a textualist that we are going by that. But I will say there are times where, of course, you're going to put on more evidence if you have it and if you think of it. and if no, it I understand impressed. the litigation strategy so point. You understand my point that. is, as a matter of law, I mean, as a matter of law. USSG, I'm, honestly, I'm just curious. Is yeah. the Solicitor General's office involved? Is. is the criminal division involved? Is this the consistent position of the United States government in circuits across it the It is country? until we hear differently from this court. Okay, that's, that's a strong statement. He said, is the SG involved, criminal division involved, and you just said, yes, it is. Well, I can speak for the cases that I know going to the Fifth Circuit. I can't speak for the SG. I haven't seen any of these other cases um, in our district, which are the ones that we watch that go up there, um, but I haven't seen anything else uh, pushing that issue. What I see is all the cases that just put on a lot of evidence. So they say, oh, it fits, but there's no real question. Was it actually required? Okay, thank you, Counselor. So, to clarify, thank you. Supplemental brief. Supplemental brief. Yeah. Here's the question that I found. I mean, it may not be determinative, but the court, the district court, who was doing most of the questioning, the only other comment the court will make is that weapon, it wouldn't be capable of being then sort of placed back on the weapon of firing here. So there's a question, as I thought about the capability of putting it back on. But then the response from Mr. Turner is, looks like he's still mute. Court, yes. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. So if, in fact, that question is there, the exact question about can it fit back on, but the guy was muted, does the government get a second chance? No, because that's talking about the bolt carrier group, not the magazine. Remember, it's the magazine that's got to be compatible. The bolt carrier group is the thing that makes the gun, which is separate from the magazine, inoperable. That's what that question was about. That's what all the questions after the agent came back on the screen were about. The, the only thing that was about compatibility at all was the prosecutor's bare statement. Okay, I guess you're right. I, right. You're right. And okay, so, so no question at all. I think so. And, and so just a couple of brief points on rebuttal. I think we're a little wrapped around the axle here. There's compatibility and operability flying around, so I'm going to do my best to just try and tease this out. J First, Judge Higginson, the operability question is de novo. It is absolutely clear error as to whether or not the district court was right about compatibility outside of whether or not we can put more evidence in on the record. That's clear error. But Well, but she's now saying two things. Either you waived it by not reobjecting after the addenda, or legally, they don't even have to meet it. It was all just sort of a charade. They, that, on hindsight, they're thinking we didn't need any of that proof. I don't have time to address. Well, I'll give you an extra minute because that was a new argument as far as I can. Right, oh. and so the, can you add a minute, please? the compatibility question is controlled, or Judge Ho isolated the right language on page 113 of the, um, uh, which is the addendum of the record. It's just a bare assertion, or it's not an assertion. The only fact contained there is it was found in proximity. And so that's the only fact we have on this record. So the question is, is that fact enough to meet the government's burden of proof, to prove beyond sufficiently reliable evidence by preponderance of the evidence? If that's under clear error, if you say no, then obviously we lose. If you, if you want to keep the record open, then you can. But if you do keep the record open, you have to address the operability issue. I know, but I'm not yet there. I hear Ms. Aikens now arguing you waived the issue. When you didn't reobject, of course we didn't. Though J Rule Rule 52A envisions contemporaneous objections, including ones that you've made before, right. and so okay. you don't have to. Go so now I hear her also saying none of this matters because we should clarify that proximity alone suffices. That's a legal argument, right? I it is, I do not think it is necessarily correct that just because a new interpretation comes out that that relieves the government of its factual burden, but it doesn't matter in this case because as to operability, okay. the, and I know you want you don't want me to go there, but I well, really Well, I just do. think we have to answer, we have to help sentencing courts 
do they or don't they have to ask and clarify that the magazine fits the gun i think they do and i think that that's plain from the language you don't require in close proximity or attached if you're not talking about a gun that works with the firearm i mean that's the reason it's able to fire it says it has the ability to fire because there's a magazine no firearm in the world can fire because of a magazine that doesn't work with it it's just not possible under the text so it has to be compatible now that it's uh, as to operability it's undisputed on this record that the bolt carrier group was missing Sorry, why does it have to be compatible as a textual matter as a textual Again, matter as a policy matter you sort of wonder no, 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 no. i'm not i'm not talking about policy at all i'm talking just text it says the definition is a fi it, uh, it means a firearm that has the ability to fire because a magazine was attached or close by how could a firearm in other words these these are elements to prove the yes. core element of capability yes and so it's just ridiculous to say capability means proximity yeah well capability is being proximity. defined in part by proximity yeah we're, we're just to show that capability is a present con uh, contemporaneous as opposed to hypothetical future but at the end of the day we're defining capability the whole point is capability That's right good. well good yes exactly and so to, to move to a couple other points really quick, Judge Ho, you asked me about United States versus Polk. First, that no, was... No, it's not a 2K21 case. It's not. Right. And so the specific language obviously matters, and so that is talking about a firearm that's possessed in connection with the offense, and firearm there is cross-referenced to the general definition of firearm. Here we're talking about a specific term, and of course what the Eighth Circuit overlooked in its Davis case is the fact that firearm is defined and has been found to be include inoperable firearms doesn't control because the specific controls over the general. That's Canon 36 in reading law, right? We, we, all, we always make sure to apply us. A specific is an exemption to the general provision. So just plug it in. Sure, a firearm generally defined includes a weapon that is designed to expel a projectile. Plug that into this definition that has the ability to fire many rounds without reloading. So obviously, the general definition gives way to that specific language that follows it. We're talking about a specific type of firearm, one that has the ability to fire uninterrupted in short order, right? The question that should always be asked of the case agent at sentencing is what? The question should be asked, one, could this firearm actually fire um, if a magazine if a magazine that's either attached to it or nearby was equipped, right? And then the second one is, is the magazine actually compatible with that firearm? But you would never get a yes answer to the first if it worked, right? No, you, on the second, yes, right? Like, so they're mutually exclusive. You, you've got to have two things. If it fires, we know it's compatible. With that magazine? Yeah. Yes, of course. So it's really just the first question. Oh, sure, yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's not hard at all to, to meet this burden of proof. And it's, and it's not hard to, um, and, and look, I, you said you'd give me an extra minute. I, I, I already did, but, but, <laughs> but I'm not really that strict. I'm Ms. Ms. Aikens made very multiple arguments, so go ahead. What do you need, 30 seconds? Yes, I just okay. want to. 30 seconds more. I do want to emphasize that, the narrowest. I, I apologize, too. I, I want to emphasize the narrowness of the ruling we're asking for here. This is the easy case because there was no evidence that a bolt carrier group was anywhere in proximity whatsoever, right? So you can leave, you can reserve the harder question whether a bolt carrier group or some other missing essential component was in close proximity to the weapon at the time the defendant possessed it, such that maybe okay. you could grab. I think we got it. You both Does have that make sense? Okay. microscopically okay. looked at it, and we appreciate that. We've got to get together three cases. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Thank you both. And once you've headed out, we'll call the second case, or I'll call it now, 21-606-1.